Hi, I'm Dan Wilton. I'm the CEO and Director of First Mining Gold,、um, joined by Jeff Renson, our Chief Operating Officer, and James Maxwell, our Vice President of Exploration. First Mining Gold is a、uh, gold development company,、uh, publicly traded on the TSX、uh, ticker symbol FF, and、uh, OTC on the US ticker symbol FFMGF.、Uh, we are a, a publicly traded developer of gold projects, holding a portfolio of projects. All located in great jurisdictions in Canada, really anchored by、uh, our two main projects: the five million ounce Springpole Gold Deposit,、uh, located in northwestern Ontario,、um, and the、uh, soon to be acquired five、uh, million ounce deposit、uh, at Duparquet, located in the heart of the Abitibi in Quebec. Dan, thank you very much for the introduction.、Uh, very nice to meet you. Very nice to have you on this call,、uh, Jeff, James. Nice to meet you both as well.、Um, <clears throat> Before we get、uh, stuck into the nitty gritty of asking technical questions about geology and the like,、um, I just want to kind of come back at the high level, Dan, if we could, because、um, First Mining Gold has got it's in addition to those two key、um, development projects. You've got Springpole, which is at the pre-feasibility stage, and you're acquiring. Um, Duparque, which is the pre-feasibility stage, you've also got a portfolio of other investments and and、um, royalties as well.、Um, I don't want to get too much into the weeds of those, but how do you see that kind of as a value block contributing to your market capitalization of the company?、Uh, well, that's a good question, Merlin. In terms of how it contributes to the market cap,、uh, you know,、uh, we, we think it doesn't. It certainly doesn't get.、Uh... Get the justice it deserves, but that portfolio、um, is now another hundred percent owned project in Cameron, which is、uh, you know a million ounce、uh, resource located in northwestern Ontario, about eighty kilometers from New Gold's Rainy River Mine,、um, uh, and the other projects、uh, that we own interest in. Um, we kind of call it the, you know, the portfolio assets are largely projects we found partners for over the last few years. So, first mining in 2016 started life as as a bit of a、um, mineral bank was the was the title.、Um, and Keith Newmeyer, our founder and chair, accumulated、uh, what ended up being acquiring eight companies or projects in about 12 months to give us this portfolio. So. Over the last few years, we've really started to focus in on the ones that we think have the the biggest potential, and are advancing those ourselves, and have brought in partners to advance、uh, the other projects that we had that you know needed a different skill set or needed、um, you know more money, kind of more geared towards earlier stage exploration. So that's、um, Ateco Minerals, who's、uh, who's developing the Pickle Crow project. Done an extraordinary job in growing that that、uh, high grade underground gold project in Ontario. We've got Big Ridge Gold and Hope Brook in Newfoundland, which again is、uh, just kind of towards the tail end of a twenty five thousand meter drill program.、Um, and we sold our Gold Lund project to Treasury Metals to、uh, combine with their Goliath project, and that's now、uh, going through its own pre feasibility study process there. So those, how we think about those, really, Merlin. In addition to the royalties, which the anchor of those royalties are those three projects that we brought partners in. You know, again, a great royalty portfolio, royalties on million ounce plus deposits at advancing stages. With you know, just the exploration on our royalty portfolio over the last couple of years has been well in excess of one hundred and fifty thousand meters of drilling. You know, you've had more than a million ounces discovered in that royalty portfolio over the last two years. So, you know, as real, real leverage to growth, which we're excited about. But,、um, you know, that really provides us with flexibility. Provides us with some financial flexibility as we move forward, because we are developing、uh, and advancing with our team and and with our own capital to. You know, major projects in Canada. Thank you. So, it's so interesting getting that background. It, it, it almost feels like、um, it was kind of like a project generator on steroids. You know, you fast tracked that that pre discovery. <laughs>、um, you know, by by acquiring those eight companies, you effectively kind of、um, shortcuts or short circuited years of that kind of discovery work, which is the the the, the hard labor of a project generator. Um, and so you kind of can go into that monetization phase.、Um, did you take out cash when you、um, 
uh, on that transaction with um on so, so what was the asset was it Goldum? Uh, Goldland. Uh, no, we basically took back at the time. Uh, it was all equivalent to about forty five percent of of the combined company. Um, about forty percent in shares and another five ish percent of value in warrants that we received. And then we distributed um, more than half of that, about 20% of Treasury medals and all of the warrants we received directly out to our shareholders, kind of as, a, as a, essentially a dividend last year. So, um, you know, the share price of Treasury certainly hasn't uh, tracked the progress at the project and the exploration results that they've had, which I think are, are very strong. Um, uh, but yeah, it's something that you don't see every day as well. Development companies that are kind of returning value to the shareholders. And at the time it was equivalent to about 10% of our, of our market cap that we distributed out. Well, your share price has been punished as well. I mean, it, it's, it's been on a um, downtrend for 18 months, much like many other um, precious metals company, you know, the, the sector peaked in mid, uh, 2020. And here we are two years later. Um, and it's been a pretty, pretty tough ride. And it's, and it, you, you're in, you're, you're no exception, unfortunately. Interestingly, when sometimes when I look at development companies, um, it feels as if it's okay to take on one, but that's going to chew up all your capital and your energy and your focus. And you guys have got the, 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 the financial leverage by those assets in the portfolio and the kind of the, in the, in the portfolio, um, um, so the, in the, in the royalties and the kind of the wider property portfolio to be able to, uh, manage that kind of digestively. Um, what was the, th sometimes when you get more mouths to feed as a, as a parent, um, the children can go hungry. Um, how, <laughs> how, do, how did, how did that conversation go at the board level with, um, the acquisition of Duparque? Uh, I mean, that was a significant part of the discussion at the board level was, you know, what is the financing flexibility that we have to move these forward? Because in order to get the Duparque acquisition done, we did uh, need to uh, have a cash component of that purchase. Now, I think we get very comfortable by the fact that when you look at the value that we are paying for Duparque, which, you know, is uh, about $5 US an ounce, for what is really the anchor tenant of a 5 million ounce plus district in the middle of the Abitibi, you know, about a third of the way between Rouen Aranda and Timmins. Um, you know, this is on a, on a hugely prospective trend that hasn't seen a lot of exploration, you know, other than really infill on the existing deposits. It's, it's barely seen exploration since the 1950s. It's kind of one of the last, uh, well, really kind of untapped areas of the Abitibi. So with all of that, I think the world had forgotten about the, the project that Clifton Star had moved forward. And when we look at really our strategy and the projects that we really like at First Mining, I think it, it, it comes down to having a fundamental underpinning of solid resource. And, you know, what, what, it puts us in a position where we don't really have to take geologic risk to underpin a resource, which you get a lot, as you know, in, you know, discovery moving into your first economic study and then moving into that pre-feasibility level, you know, your, the money you have to spend on resource conversion and just proving up what, you know, you have sitting in inferred that you run your PEAs on, um, that is very, very expensive and very risky part of the curve where we'd rather put that exploration money is to hand it to James and go find how we grow these deposits. And that's one of the things that, you know, I think Spring Pole has been a total blessing for us. It's a really geologically unique deposit. And so, it, you know, it happens to be sitting in the middle of one of, you know, the least explore, explored greenstone belts in Canada, 100 kilometers from Red Lake, Ontario, that really the, this Bertucci greenstone belt has seen very little exploration since like, you know, the 1930s, 40s, when it was first opened up. Dan, there's that's, that's plenty to unpack there. Um, my poor brain is, um, is, is being bombarded by information. Fun enough, I did want to speak about um, Spring Pole first, but um, since we started about the, the talk about conversion of ounces and the acquisition of ounces, um, I'd like to actually just 
if we could just talk a little bit about Duparque. Um, do you have a, a map of the of the the, the wider concession areas? Because you owned a hundred percent of central du parquet and you've added on the kind of the ounces around it i'd like to if, if we could just have a look at yeah, what the sure. combined pro properties look like yeah and i'll give you a, i'll give you a couple of things here first of all just to kind of orient where we are this is the town of ruin aranda which you know is a major mining center uh the horn copper smelter is in ruin this is the copper capital of canada uh right. self-proclaimed as you drive in from the airport um, uh, we're, you know, 40 kilometers north, uh, and a little bit west on a paved highway. So we own the Duquesne and the Pitt project, which we, again, first mining acquired in that 2016 timeframe. But the core of the Duparquet project is just to the east. And you can see here, you know, the distance is measured in a few kilometers. Um, but when we drill down, this is, this is the actual mineral tenure at Duparquet and just a bit of a map of the resources around it. So two past producing mines, the Beatty mine and the Donchester mine, both mined underground uh, in the 1930s to 1950s, feeding uh, a metallurgical complex at Duparquet or at Beatty, which had uh, a mill, it had a roaster, um, and uh, you know it produced gold. And it, in fact, it was at one point in uh, the 1930s the largest gold mine in Quebec. So, you know, the other, the, the, the interesting thing about this deposit, so this doesn't show some of the, the, um, the other pits that kind of work their way into the pre-feasibility study in the Central du Parquet and the Dumaco, which we're also in the process of acquiring. Um, but it, uh, you know, there's still a lot along this, along this trend. This is, you know, a main, a main part of the Porcupine Destor Fault that runs, you know, from this area you know, over to Timmins. So one of the major, major structures in, in the Abitibi gold belt. And, you know, there's a really exciting gold endowment here. Um, there's a resource, you know, when, when we're looking at it, uh, the resource from the, from the pre-feasibility in 2014, you know, more than 3 million ounces of M&I resource, um, another 1.4 million of inferred, um, and in those numbers, you know, what, what we find quite interesting is as we've been doing our work, there's still some shallow inferred in this resource. So even what Clifton Star would have had in its mine plan um, doesn't quite do justice when you start looking at strip ratios and looking at what's converting. Because, you know, even in that, they ended up mining in the Clifton PFS, it's about 1.7 million ounces. Um, there's probably, you know, uh, our estimation, and this isn't 43101, but, you know, there's probably somewhere between 10 and 20% uh, additional inferred sitting in that resource pit right now. So that, and, you know, it's underpinned by this value, but it's, uh, it's still some, I think, real upside in the near surface. And the other thing that doesn't jump out here, Merlin, that we're really excited about is just the grade sensitivity of this deposit in that, you know, there is a shallow, higher grade open pit potential that gives you some real flexibility to think about how you might um, how you might scope a project. And that's, that's a bit of flexibility that we didn't really have uh, at Springpole, to tell you the truth. So um, this, the Springpole deposit is, you know, a massive blob. Uh, it's got, it's, it's, it's continuous, not entirely homogenous, um, but it does have a kind of a higher grade core to it that, you know, the mine plan really dives down into to accelerate your payback and gives you a couple of years of, of just exceptional production and cash flow. So this, this at Duparquet has a little bit more flexibility potentially to start small and, and expand. Thank you, Dan. Um, James, if I could go over to you. Um, Jeff, I will come to you, I promise. Um, but uh, James, if I could ask you a few questions on the geology at Duparquet and the, the, this kind of major structure that comes through um, can you just describe the way that the mineralization forms in relation to the structure and along strike, please? 
Yeah, certainly. And, you know, as Dan's alluded, I mean, location, location is everything, uh, you know, when working in the Abitibi districts. And, you know, this is a project that lies, you know, square on the, the Dester Porcupine Fault Zone, which is a key contributor of the structural architecture of that region. And um, there's a lot of known gold endowment associated with, you know, these key breaks uh, within that region. And something that the Du Parquet project itself lends itself to is, you know, being associated with some of the, you know, additional structures, displays, and uh, second order features that are associated, uh, you know, with that large footprint. And we see a lot of the mineralization manifesting itself uh, on both the northern and southern uh, shear contacts associated with some of the local geology. Um, it is largely hosted at surface in a cyanitic intrusion. And a lot of times we see at the contacts of that intrusion or where we get geologic uh, interbedding and complexity of some of the volcanic units. I mean, we're really seeing that rheology contrast, you know, bring in a lot of hydrothermal alteration, uh, a lot of sulfide mineralization, a lot of it's a, a fine grained uh, pyritic sulfide. Um, but again, it's, it's got a great endowment and great legs to it. So one of the things that we do know about the Abitibi and, and some of the structural architecture of these orogenic systems, they're deep rooted. And I think that lends itself quite well to the exploration path for us. Not only do we have this critical mass at surface that certainly, um, you know, has a, a current compliant resource on it, you know, we've got exploration potential in, in what is, is a very underexplored for its depth case uh, in the Abitibi. And I think when we start evaluating our options for exploration, um, you know, and it will be going to what would be considered only in maybe maybe shallow to moderate depths of, of modern exploration, you know, on a project um, with a significant uh, location uh, in the, in a great jurisdiction. So a lot of the mineralization you're saying is related to the structure and the, 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 the second order structures in particular, whether in contact with the cyanitic, cyanitic intrusion. Um, uh, a cyanite very close in composition to a granite presumably it's quite brittle and you've got disseminated is, is, is it the fractures in it or is it actually is it i wouldn't have expected the permeability to be high but is it fracture related permeability that you're talking about in the cyanites yeah certainly there's a lot of fracturing going on and again at the contacts you do see a lot of alterations so you do get this the you know an alteration footprint surrounded you know probably at the main contact areas at the north and the south. I mean, you can see, I think, in, in, in the map that Dan had had shown of the surface projection of the resources, um, you can kind of see two key main trends there um, surrounding the surficial expression uh, of the cyanitic intrusion. Uh, things generally in the area are east-west trending with a largely southeast steep plunge to them, um, very characteristics of deposits uh, of this agent type. And for that reason, I think, you know, these are very open ended trends. I mean, it's not a case where uh, the exploration or the historic mine ran out of ore. Uh, it's one that's more characterized by just the, the timing, availability of uh, resources at the time to test deeper portions, mine deeper portions. And certainly today, um, you can see through regional synergies. Uh, there's a lot of deposits that are certainly being explored, discovered, and mined at much significant greater depth than, you know, what we currently have even uh, begun to commence at uh, Duparquet. So I, I know you've, I know, Dan, you mentioned the possibility of kind of re-engineering or reconsidering some of these as open pits, but uh, James, from what you're saying, the, the bulk of the resource package seems to be targeted as being these kind of um, down plunge extensions which can be mined from, through underground methods um, the the depth continuity can be quite large the exploration can take it down further obviously there's a cost to that exploration but once you get a handle on those shoots you, you de-risk the probability of intersecting your, your deeper zones but um, what my, I guess my question is um, what's your mining method and what's your kind of um, target grade do you think that this needs to be five grams a ton does it need to be six grams a ton to make it in and what are your kind of shoot sizes are they 100 meters across um and so it's a, it's a triple question i know i should keep my question simple <laughs> but um uh, <laughs> so three three things one is um from a modern approach merlin i mean we're definitely seeing 
uh, thicknesses of zones that are over tens of meters. And I think that's important first off is that um, for the scalability of the project, I mean, looking at exploration techniques that are looking to identify key zones that, that have a bulk mineable strategy to them, um, certainly with the grade characterization of the deposit style. I mean, you, you are in the, the single digits of grams. I mean, yes, there is some, some higher grade components and that is, you know, ideally related to a structural architecture model that, that is, uh, evolving as we push through the asset. And we'll be certainly combing through what we think some of those key controls are as we start combing through, um, are the exploration data compilation piece, you know, in the depth, uh, capacity. Uh, but that's, I think what we'd be looking for is, is something again that has, you know, a bulk mineable strategy to it, probably looking at, you know, a two and a half to three gram minimum. I think that certainly benchmarks well with what some of the regional synergies, you know, would be looking at. Um, you know, and I mean, gram meter product Merlin, you'd probably be, you know, somewhere again in the, the 60 plus is, is what you'd really be looking to achieve. Um, but certainly I think it's, it's really about, you know, how aggressive you want to be here because there, there are eight ways to probably incrementally grow this by, you know, inching it out and in step outs. And there may be some of that that happens in early controlled drilling, but certainly there is an ability to fast track this. And again, you said, you know, how would you acquire the resources for this? But, you know, it just depends on what the appetite is. And I think in order to assess, you know, the bigger part of the story, you probably want to be a bit more aggressive once you've got the controls down. And that's something that we would look to do is take some pretty punchy step outs, I think, um, once we've got comfort that we're understanding of the geology, the characterization of uh, the nature and size scalability of the target, I think at that point, you know, we would look to to try and fund forward a more aggressive campaign that would, you know, seek some of the, the roots of this system. The other thing to remember, Merlin, just in, in looking at this is, you know, your starting point here is a three to five million ounce open pit. Right. Like before you start talking about underground, we already have defined, you know, call it a three to five million ounce open pit in resource. So, you know, does it need to be At bigger Duparquet. than that right now? At Duparquet. Oh, yeah. No, there's, you know, we're, uh, as you can see, the, the resource that we had there, uh, that was the, the 20, you know, the 2014 resource is three million ounces of M&I uh, plus. And another 1.4 of uh, of inferred, you know, most of which is pit constrained. So, what okay. we're talking about here, I, I think, when you know, when not to wave arms too much and and uh, draw too many uh, aggressive comparisons, but you know, we had the opportunity to stop uh, at uh, Malartic, Canadian Malartic, on the drive up to Duparquet as we were as we were heading up. This, this project was always framed as, you know, a lookalike of Malarnik. Now, it's different geology, for sure. It's refractory, so you have to, you're going to have a different element of processing. But in terms of a large, you know, bulk tonnage opportunity with disseminated mineralization in a deposit that, when it was mined, was not looked at from a disseminated uh, mineralization perspective, you know, the, the, the other thing that people tend to lose track of here in this deposit is that the average grade in the open pit is a gram and a half. Like, yeah, you know, benchmark that's, this that's, against that's, uh, about the only about the only project that it benchmarks against from from that perspective, you know, uh, that that's close would be Hard Rock uh, that uh, that um, Equinox and Orion are now building. You know, there's not many other big open pits in Canada, bulk tonnage potential, that would have this kind not of grade. That and what and what we're telling you is that there's there's a million ounce pit inside there, as we've been you know looking at the resource. There's a million ounce pit um, at we think greater than two grams at a lower strip that you know, could be, I think, uh, that kind of starter flexibility with a really, really robust starter operation, which which is important from our perspective because a big part of the plan at Duparquet is integrating a development plan with um, uh, a plan to remediate some of the historic uh, legacy, environmental legacy on the site, which is, you know, there's arsenic contamination from roaster dust, 
uh, that from when the mine operated in the 1930s to the 1950s, there's historic tailings um, that everyone, you know, really wants to see dealt with. And I think our, you know, our, our, our hope uh, and our belief is that the best way to, uh, to move that forward is with and through the development of a mine. The only thing that really gives you the infrastructure that you need for the scale of cleanup just happens to come with enormous economic benefit for, for the community and for the region, right? So from that perspective, it's a lot of it is taking the playbook out of uh, out of the game plan at, at Hard Rock, uh, which was very similar. And we know it was very similar because uh, Steve Lines, our VP Environment and Community Relations, and, and a bunch of our team uh, spent six and a half years permitting Hard Rock. So a lot of these same issues that were dealt with there. Thank you, James and Dan. Um, Jeff, hello. <laughs> um, could you talk to me about the kind of the development plan that you're that you're working on um, for for du, um, for Duparky? I know that you haven't bought it yet, but you know when you sketch things out, when you look at what needs to be done, um, what are you what are you programming? What are, what are you lining up for your kind of work program for the next um, six to yeah, months? Yeah, thanks, Warren. So I, I think Dan has really you know hit it hit it on the head. The the focus is to see what uh, what size of uh, uh, startup we can get uh, you know lined up with a uh, uh, you know a larger um, open pit with uh, with the grade that uh, runs you know plus two grams type of thing if if we can get uh, get going on that and uh, clearly the integration of the environmental aspects within the in the region into that startup plan is is critical um, and you know, fortunately, we're in a in a region where the infrastructure is uh, extremely robust. Um, you've got uh, you know power coming in. Uh, Quebec Hydro produces uh, you know power at uh, you know four to five cents a kilowatt, um, and so you know power is a, a, a non constraint for us. And so you know, so often in these uh, uh, remote areas uh, where we're working we're, we're having to produce our own power or find a power source that's you know hundreds of kilometers away um that's not the case here we've got uh um infrastructure with uh with highways we've got uh, infrastructure with the uh um local community town du parquet uh being right there right right next to the mine and and the uh, uh the people resources are are readily available as well. So, development of a, uh, um, a starter operation that can expand is the is the key, I think, for uh, for our success. Um, but we'll look at all the different uh, you know size scenarios as well. And does that mean if you're looking at if you're still optimizing, um, does that mean this is a kind of a PFS level study that you've got to um, integrate the existing data? Uh, got to add the geological data, kind of essentially refresh a PFS which was on part of the resource base eight years ago. You effectively going to um, optimize and restate those numbers uh, in the next. However, I mean, give, give me a time frame that you aim to get uh, the next study out. And, yeah, I think uh, it's not to, a to give you a time frame of when the next study comes out um, is is a bit of a difficult question at the moment. We're still wrapping our head around. Uh, all the data that exists, uh, we know that there's uh, new data that, uh, well, data that wasn't incorporated into the PFS on, on the resource. Um, so the cutoff of the resource, uh, there's been drilling at the at the site since. Um, and so we're um, working to incorporate that into, uh, into the resource and provide an update there. Um, and I can't give you the date on that one. Dan might have a better sense of when we can get that published. Um, and then the next steps from there is to, you know, look at uh, do we move forward to uh, a PFS um, based on the new data or do we uh, enter into a, uh, updating a PEA and, and scope out the PFS um, for a uh, starter operation? 
uh, Dan might be able to provide a bit more color around that. Yeah, no, I think those that's that's kind of the range of trade-off studies that we need to do now. You know, we're we're resource blessed, and and this is uh, a resource that we think does have some important grade sensitivity to it. So um, we still need to do the work, right? Uh, we do have a a resource update which is in process. Um, and expect to have that shortly, which, as Jeff says, incorporates some of the some of the um, historic drilling that didn't make the did, kind of didn't make the cutoff in 2014, and then some of the drilling that was done subsequently. Um, but for us, you know, this is this is the opportunity to kind of take a step back, and it's grappling a, a, exactly with that question that you're asking. But I think we need a little bit more. Um, data to be able to make the answer as to the direction that we go. But the one thing we do know is that there is reasonable um, geologic uh, certainty around uh, M&I resource that if you were to go kind of from the Clifton star game plan or smaller, that there's pretty significant percentage of that that's already sitting in M&I. So you wouldn't need a lot of conversion to be able to do it at a PFS level. And a lot of the other work that was done for this project in 2014, Merlin, it's, it's people forgot about how much work was done here. They, you know, they, they, in 2012, they threw their hands up and said, oh, it's refractory, it's a disaster. Well, lo and behold, you know, two years of really thorough quality metallurgical investigation shows that with pressure oxidation, flotation and pressure oxidation, leaching of your float tails, you can get 90% plus recovery on this stuff. So yeah, there's operating and capital cost associated with that. And people throw their hands up and say, pox, it's a disaster. The reality is if you have the right deposit, um, you know, there's an enormous amount of stranded refractory, good grade refractory deposits in the Abitibi, stranded. And everyone is and from, you know, the biggest companies in the Abitibi all the way down have been looking for years at the uh, rationale and opportunity to, to think about building some refractory processing infrastructure. They didn't kind of have a center of gravity. We think the Duparquet could be that center of gravity, right? It gets, you know, as a lot of work to do. And yes, we need to update the capital and operating costs and all the rest of it. But there is some some real flexibility there with with the other thing that's changed a lot since 2014 that a lot of people don't uh, don't particularly follow that closely. But um, the ability just to produce a high grade concentrate here and move that somewhere else for processing also exists. Now, I think, uh, you know, um, it's a, it's a ways to move it, let's say, somewhere to like Nevada but uh, we're 30 kilometers from a railhead here, right? Like you could be on a train and, and to the St. Lawrence in, you know, 12 hours. Like this is not that far. So um, from that perspective, I think, you know, we just need to take a step back. The, the world's changed. A lot of the technology around processing refractory ore has changed. And so there's an element of, you know, we need to do some more optimization work. But I think we know well enough from the test work that's been done and the millions and millions of dollars that was invested in this project um, from 2008 to 2014. And ju just for context, 270,000 meters of drilling done in this project between 2008 and 2014. Replacement value of that drilling would be $50 million plus. Detailed metallurgical investigation Environmental baseline studies and sort of baseline environmental assessment work were completed to a very high degree in 2012, 2013. Like this project wasn't just kind of a, a you know, dolled up PEA. This was done at PFS level. So we inherit all of that in a, in a time when it just so happens that because it was 2014, and as you will remember, uh, the equity markets rolled over in November of 20, or uh, sorry, April of 2011. And uh, by 2014, it was, you know, utter despair, right? So 
And this was just kind of thrown out baby with bathwater. Yeah, I remember the tumbleweed kind of blowing across the resource sector. <laughs> no one cared. Um, but now there's there's a, there's a there's another project which we need to talk about. We've been talking for half an hour and we haven't spoken about your flagship, um, Spring Pole, uh, PFS Stage. Um, give me a headline, kind of, um, you know, tell me about Spring Pole just from the top down. Okay, so top down, this is uh, call it a five million ounce equivalent project. Um, large scale bulk tonnage. Um, it's about uh, one average gram, average grade is about one gram a ton plus about five grams of silver and the silver recovers in this deposit, which is something that's important. Um, uh, you know, we did a PFS in 2021 that showed on a 718 million upfront capital net present value at $1,600 gold of a billion dollars, just just shy of a billion dollars US. Um, and uh, very robust uh, pre-tax and after-tax IRRs. Um, but one of the important things on that, on Spring Pole was the, the sensitivity to gold price and the leverage this project has to the gold price. And partly because all in sustaining costs in this project you know, for the kind of core nine years of its mine life were very attractive, like sub $600 an ounce on a byproduct basis. So, and, and the reason that is, is very simple. And it comes down to the deposit itself to a degree. You know, it's a large, continuously mineralized blob of mineralization. It's a, it's a porphyry intrusive. Um, and uh, when you're in it, you're in it. Uh, there is some grade variability and, and intensity of alteration, but the deposit itself, we've got scope that, you know, a little bit more than a two to one strip ratio. Um, and, uh, you know, decent metallurgical recoveries in the, in the high eighties. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a project that is, uh, you know, big and robust and, and a big part of, it, of, of the robustness of it is, in the location of it, um, you know, it's a tight footprint. So coming out of the pit, you're kind of half a kilometer to the mill and you're half a kilometer to the waste dumps. So there are no real long hauls in this project either, which is something that's, that, you know, when, when mining engineers get their hands on this project, they love it because, you know, you just don't see projects of this continuity in you know, for open pit mines in Canada. Thank you for the top down, uh, James. Can you just describe to me the um, the porphyry, the wall rock interaction, the, the, the distribution of mineralization within the uh, within the porphyry, please? Yeah, the distribution again. It's it's a very large scale uh, endowment. Uh, it's got a massive footprint of just approximately you know just over one and a half kilometers in strike and certainly trends down significantly to the to the southeast and you know we do believe that there's you know massive extensions and potential offsets of the zones available for for discovery um you know again we've got you know a critical mass as a starting piece here um hosted at the deposit site itself and it's something that we believe that you know these things are are very underexplored like largely owing to the lack of characterization uh, of the belt itself i mean certainly archean uh, age deposits of this type are you know somewhat rare and traditionally somewhat a little bit misunderstood i think historically so we're looking at the exploration components of you know how best uh, we can vector using i think some of the some of the metrics of the deposit itself, which will include, you know, the geochemical footprints, uh, some of the structural uh, setup uh, of the deposit itself um, that we're using actually not just at the brownfields uh, air regions of, of spring pole, but what we've built in uh, consolidated ground position of almost 70,000 hectares uh, surrounding spring pole in the Bertucci belt. So um, we do have a great ability to leverage the direct geology at spring pole. And on top of that, I mean, Dan and the team uh, have done a great job on a number of deals that have consolidated the belt uh, into a district scale position. And, you know, we believe that, you know, a prospectivity pipeline uh, is a great factor to drive this project, but, you know, has critical mass already in a resource uh, towards, uh, you know, what will be a long term operating asset. And sorry, do, do the five million ounces, does that sit within one structurally contiguous 
kind of pit it, 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 how deformed is it how broken up is it i mean and is it mineralized from surface so there's a couple of main zones there i mean the portage zone is certainly the the key mass uh, that's situated just at the southeastern portion of the project center um there is a starter pit in the east extend, extension zone um that will i think uh, operate and feed stock for at least uh, the first period of, of development uh, in the proposed uh, project pfs that's uh, released in 2021 um, but we do see, you know, uh, the ability to, to further extend and move beyond, you know, what's been previously outlined. And we're seeing that as we start to do some of the optimization around the project, do some of the geotechnical and de-risking uh, drilling associated with the infrastructure. I mean, we're seeing uh, some very good signs and indications that the system remains strong. Uh, and that it is a complex system. I think it's one of the challenges here uh, for unlocking for our team is really looking at you know the, the some of the some of the the key um, paleo uh, call it depositional uh, environment and, and how that relates to uh, an alkaline intrusion system because it certainly has only been again explored to very moderate depth levels. I mean, there's not a lot of drilling, you know, below the two and 300 meter depth level uh, within the deposit area. And certainly when we go to the broader scale of the belt, I mean, a lot of that has only been, you know, tested within, you know, moderate prospecting and drilling with tiers down to the first 100 meters. So in, in the development plan, is, is it an open pit down to 300 meters? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's it's all this is this is sitting in one pit and one pit with a 2.2 to 1 strip ratio. What's the what's the work plan going on from here? I mean, it's, it's it was a PFS published last year. Um, you you you're obviously doing some geotechnical drilling, James. You mentioned that. Um, how much? Um, you, you know, what, what does the work program look like from here on in? Uh, well, they uh, let's talk about kind of what's been done since uh, 2021. So feasibility level met program uh, confirmatory uh, largely around the flow sheet, which was, uh, you know, crush, grind, float, um, leach the float tails, regrind the float con, and then leach the float con. Um, a lot of work done on uh, engineering around um, an alternate tailings solution, which uh, the PFS had just, you know, commingled uh, dry stack uh, filtered tails and waste rock. We wanted to show you could build this without a conventional tailings dam. You can, uh, but, you know, it's not the best solution. We think the best solution as you're already concentrating 90% plus of the sulfur in a flotation concentrate at the cost of a separate leach circuit, you can keep all of that, all those high sulfur tails uh, and put those in their own, basically, uh, you know, their own tailings facility. Um, and it, it allows you to, take what would otherwise in the commingled uh, thing be 120 million tons of pagtails and make, you know, 100 million tons of nagtails and 20 million tons of pagtails. So that I think is was something that as we went through getting the environmental assessment ready, um, you know, we did a lot of work on, on scoping out what we thought was a better long-term environmental scenario. And then a lot of the rest of it, I mean, in the you know, the uh, the part, I'm just going to throw this up uh, on the screen here because this is, uh, you know, this is the great uh, challenge that everyone seems to have with this deposit is that it is sitting under the bay of a lake. And so the development plan involves, you know, building a couple of dikes and, uh, and dewatering the lake, open pit mine. And at the end of the mine life, you know, the, the, the pit fills back up. Um, and then ultimately the, the dikes are removed or altered to create uh, fish habitat. And, um, you know, the, the lake is reclaimed. So, um, yeah, no, I think this is uh, in terms of a lot of our focus and effort on the permitting and environment side towards the environmental assessment. And a really important milestone that we hit uh, a couple of months ago was publishing our draft environmental assessment which was really for the first time having in the public domain, you know, a really thorough, comprehensive and well thought out uh, plan, environmental plan for the development of the project, um, you know, 10,000 pages long. And that's now been in the hands of regulators and communities. Uh, we're starting to get 
uh, a lot of comments back. And I think, you know, by the middle of Q4 should have a really good sense from those comments. Um, if there are any, you know, significant extra data collection efforts that we're going to need, or if there are any, you know, really significant concerns um, around the around the game plan here. But, you know, we're lucky to, to, to have brought Jeff on uh, a few months ago as our chief operating officer, because Jeff's got an enormous amount of background in working with tails and water, which is a lot of what this project from a from an environmental perspective has to deal with. So, Jeff, you can talk a little bit more about, you know, the game plan that's undergoing now in terms of, you know, water balance, mass balance, hydrogeology, and really kind of, you know, buttoning down the water side of it. Well, also the critical aspect I'd, I'd like you to talk about, Jeff, is, is, is timelines and kind of milestones in, in the process. Um, Dan, could you drop the slide, please? Let's go back to the talking heads. Thanks, Dan uh, and and Merlin. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a perfect segue into you know the focus of our feasibility study at the moment is uh, you know ensuring that uh, we keep the uh, EA process moving forward and we're able to respond to the uh, to the comments that come in from the uh, regulatory uh, uh, bodies as well as the uh, communities. And um, so obviously that takes uh, quite a lot of technical work, the engineering work um, around all the water management uh, tends to be the focus of the, of the comments that come in. Um, when you consider uh, mining below uh, an existing lake, um, you know, that uh, raises lots of uh, questions and curiosities uh, amongst, uh, amongst the public and, and the uh, regulators. Um, and so, you know, what we're doing is uh, demonstrating, as Dan said, that there's uh, there's precedent here um, from, you know, numerous mines up uh, in northern, northern Canada, um, you know, with the diamond mines and then a couple of the gold uh, operations um, up in the northern Canada around uh, Meadowbank and, and Divik. Uh, um, Gatchukwe, different uh, operations that have built dikes and dewatered lakes. Um, and so the focus going forward in the timelines is uh, we, we uh, expect to be uh, well through the technical engineering work on the um, dewatering hydrogeologic work. Um, what is the continuity between the, between the lake and the open pit? What is the uh, um, design you know requirements for holding uh, holding the lake back uh, with the dikes um, you know we expect to be through that uh, engineering process uh, you know third quarter next year um, good uh, a good amount of uh, uh, characterization work was done this last winter that uh, we're now incorporating into the models and uh, so that we're able to uh, make you know solid uh, predictions on uh, on flows and uh, what the uh, water flows and, and rates will be coming at us that we need to deal with so that characterization work is an assessment at the moment uh, and we'll get into more basic uh, level engineering in uh, in the new year and do you have to uh, take uh, environmental officials up to the mines in northern Canada to kind of show them how it's done, or um, can they uh, appreciate it from? Yeah. Um, from um, the so pictures? recently, we've had uh, the uh, authorities from uh, from DFO uh, up at the site and did a, uh, um, a fish uh, sampling program. Um, and so there's, as, as Dan mentioned, there's an enormous baseline of environmental data. Uh, collected at the project uh, over the last 10 plus years. Um, so there's a great amount of data to, to leverage. Um, and so that's uh, been used in the uh, environmental assessment to date. The, uh, the different uh, regulatory authorities have, have come and visit us, uh, visited the site over the last couple of years, and we continue to, uh, to host them going forward to uh, um, to go through the the data and, and see the data and see the site for themselves um, on a on a regular basis. As, as I say, just last month, the uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans was there. 
joined our team to do uh, a fish sampling uh, program at uh, Springport Lake. Good. Well, thank you, um, Jeff, and um, good luck with all of those programs. Um, now, we've been talking for probably 45 minutes or a little bit longer. So there's so much to kind of unpack in this company. Uh, company. There's so many elements to it uh, that I think it's been extremely worthwhile going through all of them. But um, kind of just by way of wrapping up, I look forward to seeing how the the, the, the acquisition of Duparque goes. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see kind of ongoing news flow out of uh, Springpole as you kind of keep walking towards those, um, um, you know, meeting those deadlines and kind of those, those milestones of permitting and technical de-risking as you go forward. Um, and thank you both. Well, thank you all very much for uh, joining, when, joining me on the call. Dan, do you want to just kind of um, share some parting thoughts uh, before we wrap up? Yeah, no, sure. Merlin, I certainly appreciate the opportunity. And uh, I guess if we're looking at catalysts and milestones coming forward, uh, we think there's going to be a lot of them here with this company. Um, you know, really uh, getting these comments back, let's start with Springpole on the environmental assessment, really starting to be in a position to, to start talking about some of the uh, field work that we've done on regional exploration this year. Uh, we're flying a big uh, geophysical program, really, for the first time, detailed geophysics over uh, the bulk of the Bertucci Greenstone Belt, uh, which I think is going to be a really interesting and proprietary data set that we are then going to have to go, you know, use that in combination with the rest of the field work that James and the team have done over the summer in terms of targeting. Um, this is, this is tacking, you know, one of the, I think one of the most exciting exploration opportunities in Canada, um, onto a 5 million ounce deposit, right? Uh, and the opportunity is near the deposit and it's regionally. So that's all going well, feasibility work ongoing, really trying to culminate in a feasibility study that should be done around the same time as we submit the final environmental assessment document. The real time frame of that is going to be driven a little bit, Merlin, by um, the path that uh, the Indigenous communities around the project want to take on their assessment, making very good progress um, with a couple of the communities. Um, and uh, and in discussions about how, uh, how a few of the communities closest to the project uh, want to move forward on their assessment, but we're, you know, we're optimistic on that. Um, but I think that ends up kind of being the, the driver of timing, uh, because we obviously need to incorporate their views and comments in the final EA. We want to have that done before it gets submitted. Um, so, you know, targeting submitting a final EA, you know, middle, middle to Q3 of next year. Um, uh, but again, we're still trying to figure out the ultimate uh, timing of that. I think we'll have the engineering work largely done in support of that with a feasibility study that will be completed on what we submit in the final EA. So it's a little bit of chicken and egg that we got a bunch of the work that we're doing now. But, you know, you kind of need to confirm that project scope before it goes forward. But targeting ultimately, you know, submitting that final EA with everyone's comments in and, and alignment really built, which I think would be uh, would be fantastic if we can get there. And then on Duparque, updated resource, uh, and I think uh, an updated economic study within 12 months, uh, faster if we, can, if we can leverage more of the existing data that's there. Uh, starting to frame an exploration story around Duparque, and ultimately, you know, we're looking forward to uh, getting some, you know, getting some uh, drills turning there and uh, starting to put a bit more of our own stamp and footprint on that deposit as well. Great. Well, I look forward to the uh, to the news flow and uh, thank you very much for taking the time and I look forward to the next one. Thanks, Great. Merlin. Thanks, Merlin. Thanks, Merlin.